continue. Welcome to the Arizona Bioethics Network. ABN is a nonprofit organization that has been offering ethics education to the Arizona healthcare and biomedical research communities for over 15 years. ABN provides access to research resources, offers educational programs, and creates networking opportunities at which biomedical and healthcare professionals can collaborate and exchange ideas. We are an independent 501c3 organization that depends upon support from our members and the organizations that have given us in-kind donations. They make programs such as this possible. We would like to thank the following contributors. Welcome to the Arizona Bioethics Network, ABN. Thank you very much for joining us today. As usual, things are not going like they should immediately. But we're delighted today that you're joining us and we are especially delighted that we have Professor Thaddeus Pope to talk with us about voluntary or dementia advanced directives, stop eating and drinking, and some of the ramifications and options available to those in Arizona. Um, professor Pope is a professor at Health Law Institute Mitchell Hamlin School of Law and holds adjunct posi positions at the Australian Health Center for Health Law Research, Queensland University of Technology and the Alden March Bioethics Institute. He also serves as visiting professor of medical jur jurisprudence at St. George's University in Grenada, West Indies, and he's affiliate faculty, University of Minnesota Center for Bioethics. Uh, Dr. Pope also has his own blog, which has, uh, covers a lot of interesting material, and we're really excited to have him here. Um, you can, I think you can share your screen now, if you'd like, Professor Pope. All right, I'll do that, thank you. And you're, you're free to go, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so hopefully everything's working now. And uh, I'll just, okay. Yeah, so uh, good evening, everybody. So my title's Avoid Late Stage Dementia, Advanced <laughs> Directives for Stopping Eating and Drinking. Uh, so thanks for having me, uh, Arizona Bioethics Network. Thanks for joining everybody else. Uh, I actually last spoke to the Arizona Bioethics Network seven years ago in June of 2014. So it's been a while. Um, and uh, so thanks for having me back. Uh, it's actually been a long time. And so I started thinking about time and that got me to thinking about time travel movies. Uh, I like these sorts of movies. Maybe you also, you do too. Um, so there's like movies like Back to the Future uh, Star Trek IV, Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, uh, The Edge of Tomorrow, Peggy Sue Got Married, and perhaps most famously, Terminator, right? And the, the storyline of Terminator, right, is that you have to go back in time to kill the young John Connor so he doesn't grow up to lead the resistance. Right, so the, the, the core thesis of this movie, right, is you, you're going back in time to kill, you know, somebody's, your younger self. But what about going forward in time into the future to kill your older self? Kind of the, the opposite of the Terminator movie. Um, and specifically, not just your older self, but your older self in late stage dementia, right? This, this isn't science fiction, um, and in fact, it's the it's it's one of the key uh, issues in a new book that I have coming out with Tim Quill, Paul Menzel, and Judy Schwartz in a few weeks, called "Voluntarily Stopping Eating and Drinking: A Compassionate, Widely Available Option for Hastening Death." 
So here's the, here's the roadmap for, for, for tonight uh, in four parts. Uh, first, talk about the fear of dementia. Then what are the traditional last resort options for avoiding late stage dementia? Uh, and then move specifically to VSED and then to stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive. And my goal is to, is to finish in 30 minutes so we can see what everybody else wants to talk about. All right, so there is a big fear of dementia and has been for a while, right? This, that was what motivated uh, Janet Adkins, uh, Jack Kevorkian's uh, first patient. Uh, and you have a lot of books, like the book about her, but you have a lot of books with provocative titles like, Oh, Let Me Not Get Alzheimer's Sweet Heaven, Why Many People Prefer Death or Active Deliverance to Living with Dementia. And what, and, and there's a lot of other books like this. Um, and there's a lot of, and I'm going to get back to this, but there's a lot of uh, dementia directives, right? Uh, tools for helping people avoid living through the later stages of dementia. So what are people afraid of? They're afraid of a lot of things. A few of those are, they're afraid of not remembering who they are. Uh, they're afraid of not recognizing their family. They're uh, concerned about not being able to go to the bathroom themselves, making abusive comments to others. And, and so how can you avoid um, living in a state like this that you wouldn't want to live in, that you would find undignified. Um, there are some traditional last resort options. Um, and three main ones. Uh, one is, of course, you can refuse treatment, right? And traditionally, that's thought of as being things like mechanical ventilation, CPR, antibiotics, and clinically assisted nutrition and hydration. Um, and of course, you can always refuse these things everywhere um, if you still have capacity to do so. Um, and if you lack capacity, as you will in, in later stages of dementia, then you can refuse those forms of treatment through an agent or surrogate or through a living will or through a pulse. Um, and the, this has all been settled for decades and decades uh, in Arizona since at least the Rasmussen case and probably before that. But um, people in late stage dementia typically aren't dependent upon any of those forms of therapy. So you have a right to refuse them, but it would sort of be analogous to, I have the right to refuse the offer to star in a new Tom Hanks movie. Yeah, I have the right to refuse, but nobody's exactly making the offer either. So the, so the right to refuse these, form, these traditional forms of life-sustaining therapy just aren't typically relevant in the dementia context. Um, another end-of-life exit option is medical aid in dying, right? This is perhaps the most discussed end-of-life option today because it's always in half a dozen state legislatures and gets a lot of media coverage. Uh, so this is where you can ask and receive a prescription drug, right, that you may then self-administer to hasten your death. Uh, this is now legal in 11 states, uh, but not Arizona, right? You had a number of bills this session. You had a number of bills last session. You had a number of bills back in 2019, uh, but, but it still hasn't, none of them have been passed. Uh, but immediately to the West in California, immediately to the East, in New Mexico, medical aid and dying is legal. Uh, and you can go there, right? Now you might say, well, Professor Pope, don't you have to be a resident of that state, um, right? The law requires that you be a resident of that state to access medical aid and dying. True, but that's very easy eligibility requirement to satisfy, right? It's, it's first of all, it's only confirmed by the attending physician. Uh, so it's not like applying for a passport or TSA pre-check or something like that. Um, the, the, the attending is just gonna look for certain indicia of residency, like a driver's license, voter registration, a tax return, or that you own or lease property. Leasing property is pretty easy thing to satisfy. We, any of us could go on Craigslist right now, find some 
apartment in, in Southern California and, and rent it all, all in the next half hour. So uh, pretty, and now, and now we're a resident of California for purposes of the End of Life Options Act. So it's a pretty low bar, but um, there are other eligibility requirements um, and you probably can't satisfy those when you have, if you're trying to qualify on the basis of dementia because you need to be terminally ill, which means you have a six month or less prognosis and you have to have decisional capacity. And the problem with the way almost pretty much every dementia works is that by the time you're terminal in the later stages of the trajectory, you're no longer gonna have capacity. And in the earlier stages of dementia, uh, when you still have capacity, you're not going to be terminally ill. So you, you can't satisfy both of those at the same time. So may just generally isn't relevant for dementia patients. Uh, and then the, then the other option that's discussed is palliative sedation to unconsciousness. Uh, so this is where you sedate somebody, not just mildly, but so deeply that they're completely unconscious. And it's not just temporary as a respite from some kind of episode, but it's permanent or continuous. So if you sedate somebody that much, they're, they're going to be dependent upon clinically assisted nutrition and hydration because they, they're unconscious. They can't feed themselves or even be fed. Um, now, typically the patient refuses clinically assisted nutrition and hydration when, when they all, when concurrent with agreeing to PSU. But the problem here is that almost every relevant medical society uh, thinks that uh, palliative sedation unconsciousness has a relatively narrow scope of indication, meaning it's really only available for people who are suffering and that suffering is intolerable and refractory to other things. Moreover, it's really limited to physical suffering, not existential suffering. So, um, this again, just may not be relevant um, or, or applicable to the dementia context. So that's not gonna typically be an option either. So none of these three traditional typical uh, end of life exit options is really relevant or available uh, in the dementia context. So that brings us to VSED, right? So this is an acronym, V-S-E-D, VSED, Voluntary Stopping Eating and Drinking. And here, what this means is we're talking about a patient with capacity, with decision-making capacity, and she is able to take food and fluid by mouth. So we're not talking about somebody so far, uh, so close to death that, that her body's literally shutting down. She can eat, she but she's making a voluntary, deliberate decision to stop. It's not a physiological thing. It's, it's an intentional thing. And the goal in doing that is to cause death from dehydration. Right, that of course will happen if you don't take any fluids in, you will die from dehydration. That's gonna happen in eight to 14 days. Those deaths are widely reported to be peaceful and comfortable, right? We have a lot of first person narratives now. Uh, we have uh, bo whole books on this, like uh, Gramp, this is one of the older books, Gramp, uh, Choosing to Die, uh, Taking Control, uh, a different ending. We have films on this, like Dying Wish, uh, Tomorrow Never Knows. There's a lot more on YouTube. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of stories other, in other places. We have TED Talks. Um, there's a lot of VSED narratives collected on, by End of Life Washington, and also by a newer organization called VSED Resources Northwest. Um, I, I actually edited a whole bunch of, per, of first person narratives in this bioethics journal a few years ago. And um, it's not just first person narratives where it's the patient or the family talking about their experience, um, but we have a lot of objective evidence about the patient experience with VSED. Um, this is a study from the New England Journal of Medicine. And in the study, they had 100 Oregon nurses who were caring for VSED patients, patients undergoing VSED. And they reported, the nurses reported that most of those deaths were peaceful with little suffering. Uh, now, VSED takes a lot longer than MAID. MAID takes a matter of hours. 
um, V said takes eight to 14 days. So, but the, the, but the silver lining there is that it provides an opportunity for reflection, for family interaction and mourning. And it's actually preferred by many patients. Uh, so in this study, remember this study took place in Oregon, which for a long time has had legal medical aid in dying. Um, and even though MAID was available, almost twice as many people chose VSED. Um, similarly, in the Netherlands, where euthanasia has been available for many decades, um, up to 2% of all deaths in the Netherlands are from VSED. Um, and that is more than half of the deaths from euthanasia. So it's generally thought to be a good option. Um, what's, what's the clinical status? Um, well, we have a lot more experience with VSED uh, the past few years. Um, the number of surveys assessed its prevalence and, and, and clinician comfort and familiarity. Um, one study from Japan, they surveyed 300 hospice and palliative care specialists. A third had experience with VSED. Um, in Switzerland, they surveyed 751 family physicians. Again, a third had experience with VSED. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, they inter surveyed 700 family physicians um, and about half there had experience with VSED. Um, and then in Germany, they surveyed 255 palliative care specialists um, and, and nearly two thirds had experience with VSED. Um, and it's not just that we have more clinical experience, but there are also more professional society, medical association position statements on VSED, uh, you know, endorsements. So from the Austrian Palliative Society, from the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care, from the American Nurses Association, uh, from the American Medical Women's Association, uh, from ESPEN, from ASPEN, um, and from the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. Um, and there's also more clinical guidance, you know, guidelines for how to do it uh, from the Royal Dutch Medical Association, from, and there have been articles published in JAMA and in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society. Um, and then of course we have clinical guidance, maybe that comprises about half of our new book coming out next month. So in sum, V said is an end of life option that is broadly accepted both in the public but in, and in the medical profession and is evidence-based. Um, so I wanna just turn then just to look at Arizona specifically. Um, so there have been, you know, a lot of patients who've used VSED in Arizona. This is just one patient. Her, her case was profiled on Arizona Public Radio, so it had a relatively high uh, exposure. Um, now she didn't have dementia. She, she had a muscular wasting uh, disease. She, and, and in fact, to, to my earlier point, she had actually had wanted to and had planned to use palliative sedation on consciousness, but that ultimately was refused by her clinicians and then V said became her backup. Um, and there are a number of other patient stories of patients that used V said uh, that are collected on the Arizona end of life options website. But to turn to dementia specifically, um, this is a little bit challenging because you definitely can V said while you still have capacity. That's generally thought to be uncontroversial uh, legally and ethically. Um, the problem though is that for many people will be too soon. Meaning um, while they still have capacity, they still find their life enjoyable and worthwhile. Um, so they sort of have, the, there's an obstacle here or challenge. They think maybe they could get around that by saying, well, I'm not gonna V said until right before I lose capacity. Um, it, it, you know, then I'm not really gonna have to give up much valuable time what this is sometimes called the 10 minutes to midnight rule, meaning at midnight you lose capacity. So you don't, you don't uh, do the V set until right before you lose capacity, 10 minutes to midnight. The problem with that, and it's a big problem, is that um, 
it's a little bit difficult to anticipate or time when exactly you may lose capacity. So that window of opportunity can unexpectedly close and you may lose capacity before UV said. Um, so therefore, many people there think, well, then I'm going to build in a buffer and I'm going to have to V-SED even more in advance. I don't want to, but in order to be able to do it, I'm going to have to V-SED more in advance of when I expect to lose capacity. And that works. The problem is that you are um, giving up a fair amount of time that you, again, time that you actually would have found life enjoyable and worthwhile. So this is sometimes called the problem of premature dying. So that brings us to the main topic, um, stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive, which is a way to get around that problem of premature dying. So the core notion here is that you can complete an advanced directive today, June 16th, 2021, um, directing VSED in the future. Right at a point that you specify, right when you and you could specify the, the conditions that matter to you when you don't recognize your family, when you can't do this or that, um, and you're directing your future caregivers to not give you food and fluid by mouth. This is growing increasingly popular over the past three years or so. Um, now, there was actually a visa, an advanced directive for stopping eating and drinking published in JAMA 25 years ago um, in 1996, but this really picked up in just the past three years. Um, so you have special uh, forms or tools um, published by End of Life Choices New York, by End of Life Washington, by Dartmouth, um, by Compassion and Choices, uh, by Exit. Um, and actually right next door in Nevada, the official state form approved and enacted by the legislature um, has a special end of life. This is an advanced directive for adults with dementia, end of life decisions addendum statement of desires, which includes an option whether or not to get food or fluid. Um, and, then, and then final exit network has their own supplemental advanced directive for dementia. And it's worth noting that Final Exit Network has not only the form, um, but also what, you, what they call a program. Because if you have challenges getting a clinician or a, a facility to honor your uh, supplemental advanced directive, then they will help uh, make sure that it gets honored. And then of course, in addition to all those forms, people are just drafting their own or they're getting a lawyer to draft their own. So those are just the pre-prepared ones, right? There's a lot of people just um, doing custom advanced directives for stopping eating and drinking. So can this work in Arizona? Well, Arizona, of course, recognizes advanced directives and they recognize your ability to uh, protect, to, to exercise prospective autonomy. Right, that you ways to get your wishes heard even when you can no longer speak for yourself. Now, there's two main ways to do that, uh, and one is to do it with a document, and the other is to do it through a person. So, just do these one by one. Right, in terms of a document in in Arizona, there's there's two main documents. There's a living will, and there's a post. Um, but let me just clear some of these options off the table so we can zero, zero and focus down. The post form in, in Arizona, as, as almost everywhere, generally has pre-printed instructions that say offer food by mouth if feasible. So it, it doesn't appear that a post would be the right instrument uh, to exercise an advance directive, uh, to, an advance request for stopping eating and drinking. Um, so generally, an advanced directive for stopping and drinking would have to be a living will in terms of the document, not, not a post. In terms of a person exercising your prospective autonomy through a person rather than through a document, right? there's, there's generally three types of substitute decision makers, um, and we have different names for them depending on how they got their authority to speak for you, um, depending on who appointed them. Right. If the patient herself appoints the, the substitute decision maker, then we call that person an agent. If they're picked off the 
statutory priority list, uh, then we call them a surrogate. And if the court, if a court or judge appoints them, then we call that person a guardian. And again, just to clear some of these options off the table so we can zero down, um, you may recall in Arizona a few years ago, the Jesse Ramirez case. And uh, his wife was controversially making healthcare decisions for him. And in the aftermath of that case, the legislature amended several statutes, basically saying that a surrogate who's not the patient's agent, meaning not chosen or designated by the patient herself, shall not consent to or approve the withdrawal of food or fluid. So I take from that, that, that basically we're gonna take, this, that a surrogate or a guardian are not gonna be authorized to make uh, a decision about stopping eating and drinking on behalf of an incapacitated patient. It's gonna to have to be an agent, right? So the substitute decision maker for stopping eating and drinking by an advanced directive in Arizona would have to be an agent. Um, so we're just going to focus on agents and living wills, right? And none of the other types of advanced directives or, sur or types of surrogates. Um, now, generally, actually, you, sh you should have both. So I'm not going to separate them. I mean, generally, you, you, you would not want to have a living will without an agent, and you probably normally wouldn't have an agent without some type of some instructions or guidance for that agent. So normally, you would have both. Um, so can you have uh, an advanced director for stopping eating and drinking in Arizona. Um, and I like to use a traffic light, red, yellow, green for this, right? Green would mean it's explicitly permitted. Um, and that I do think is the case in Nevada because of that form that I showed you that was approved by the legislature. Um, a red light would mean it's explicitly prohibited. Um, and that's the case in, in several states, including Wisconsin, where the, the, the statute says, no, this is not something, in directing the stopping of oral food and fluid is not something you can do in an advanced directive or with, with your healthcare agent. But a yellow light would mean it's not explicitly permitted, but it's also not explicitly prohibited. And I think that is where Arizona falls in the middle there. Um, so the relevant language for a living will in Arizona is a living will, with a living will, you can control, leave instructions about your health care treatment decisions. And similarly, you can appoint an agent. And then that agent, when you lose capacity, will be entitled to make health care decisions. So the sorts of things you can do with, it, with, the, with the living will or, or the types of things your agent could do are health care uh, decisions. So what's healthcare? Well, I just want to contrast quickly uh, Vermont, just to take an example. Um, in Vermont, advanced directives aren't limited to healthcare. In advanced directive, you can leave instructions about healthcare, but also personal circumstances, also activities of daily living, and a bunch of other things. So some states actually, the advanced directive allows you to make a broader range of decisions, not just health care decisions, but Arizona is limited to healthcare decisions. Now, healthcare surely includes artificial feeding tubes, artificial nutrition and hydration, but does it also include just regular food and fluid by mouth? Well, the statute doesn't define healthcare. Um, it does actually define healthcare provider. Um, and, and actually, that helps because the logic is that if, if something's provided by a healthcare provider, then that is healthcare. Right? The things that healthcare providers provide is healthcare. And in fact, that has been tested, not, not in the VSED context, but it's been tested a number of times in the Arizona appellate courts. Um, in any case, VSED is part of a broader treatment plan. Um, and in fact, so much so that some people don't even use the word VSED. Uh, a group in Boston actually calls it PAVSED because which stands for palliated and assisted voluntarily stopping eating and drinking to emphasize the role of the clinician here. Um, it, it, is, it of course is recognized as healthcare by the medical profession. I mean, that's why you have all these position statements and clinical guidance. And, and even, even if you think of things like uh, former Chief Justice Rehnquist, 
said, you know, your bodily integrity is violated just as much by sticking a spoon in your mouth as by sticking a needle in your arm. So we don't make these uh, distinctions about how technological something is in order to qualify as healthcare. Now, th that all said, there is a push to say that uh, food and fluid by mouth, hand feeding, isn't healthcare and that it's basic care. I don't think that's right, but the argument is out there. So I'm trying to be circumspect. Um, if that's true, then stopping eating and drinking by advanced directive would fall outside the scope of what the Arizona statute, both the durable power of attorney for healthcare agent part of the statute and the living will part of the statute allow you to do. That said though, you could still have an, adva an Arizona advanced directive for stopping eating and drinking. You could have a non-statutory advanced directive. It, it doesn't comply with the statute. It doesn't mean it's not a valid advanced directive. Um, this was this is clear um, from the Arizona Supreme Court's case in Rasmussen, as well as more recent cases, um, that your right to leave instructions about your future health care should you lose capacity don't come solely from the statute. Um, so again, this may not fit within the scope of the statute. That's okay. Using or complying with the statute is optional um, because you have these rights to complete an advanced directive and to have it honored as a matter of rights under not just the state statute, but also under the federal constitution, the Arizona state constitution, and also Arizona common law. Now that said, in the real, that, so it's a legal advanced directive, but in the real world, I recognize that you're gonna have, you would have a more difficult time getting clinicians to honor it because they will, want it to comply with, with the statute. For one reason is the statute gives civil, criminal, and professional discipline immunity. So if you comply with the statute, you earn that sort of bright line, clear legal immunity, and you don't have that when you don't comply with the statute. But there's one more option, um, and that's that you could complete an out-of-state advanced directive for stopping eating drinking. Um, so like I said, right next door in Nevada, they have this, you know, advanced directive for adults with dementia, end of life decisions, addendum statement of desires. So you could complete that um, and then bring it back to Arizona. And Arizona law says that an out of state. So for example, Nevada advanced directive is valid in this state, Arizona, if it was valid in the place where it was adopted. So it's, it's a reciprocity provision. Um, so let's assume that you have a valid advanced directive for stopping eating and drinking. Whether, and again, that could be an Arizona advanced directive, it could be a non-statutory directive, or it can be an out-of-state directive. The big problem, this is like a, more the bioethics part of this, uh, is, is revocation. This, this is the trickiest part. Um, because in your late stage of dementia, you may say or otherwise make some gesture of, of thirst or discomfort. Um, and so now we have a contradiction. Your past self said you didn't want food or fluid, but your, your self right now appears to want some fluid. Um, so this is sometimes referred to as the problem of the incapacitated veto, right? Because you, you definitely lack capacity. Um, and this is a very big challenge for dementia directives, right? Because the question, the question, this is a tough question. There's a lot of activity right now in the bioethics journals. Whose wishes do we respect? The prior self who wrote the directive or the current self, or sometimes this is called as the now patient versus the then patient. Um, now, some people think, well, we could get around that uh, dilemma of choosing there if we had the patient write a Ulysses clause, if she anticipated this problem in advance and said something like, I don't want hand feeding, even if I, even if I ask for it, or even if I appear to cooperate in being fed by opening my mouth. In other words, um, the Ulysses clause would say, don't you listen to my, you listen to me, the, the past self, the one who wrote the advanced directive, don't you listen to my future self. Now, some states actually have very strong 
uh, laws to back up Ulysses clauses like that, like Vermont and Virginia. Um, and in the Netherlands, you could even have an advance, uh, you could have a Ulysses clause even for advance uh, euthanasia requests. But um, in Arizona, I'm not sure how it's gonna go because the revocation, so you could, how can you revocate your advance directive in Arizona? You can do that by doing any of these things. You can make a written revocation, you can orally notify your healthcare provider, you could make a new healthcare directive, and then fourth, any other act that demonstrates a specific intent to revoke, right? Any other act that demonstrates an intent to revoke. That's a pretty broad catch-all. Um, and so therefore, if there's some gesture or utterance made by the, the person in the very late stage of dementia, stage six or stage seven Alzheimer's, she doesn't really understand what she's talking about, but it, it's, it might qualify here as a revocation. I just wanna contrast California, for example, where you need to have capacity to revoke your advanced directive. So um, this problem of accidentally or inadvertently revoking your own advanced directive would be less of a problem in California where you, ha where you have to have capacity to revoke. Um, I'm not sure you could have a Ulysses clause in Arizona. And, and it's worth noting that Ulysses clauses are generally unwelcome. Um, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine, AMDA, uh, says uh, we're not, we don't think these should be honored. We should focus on the current self, the patient in our long-term care facility right now on Wednesday afternoon. That's, that's, we prioritize that person. Um, if the advanced directive conflicts with that, then the advanced directive uh, falls. Uh, we prioritize the current self over the past self. So even if the visa directive is perfectly valid, uh, their, their advice to, their, to the long-term care community is to not honor them. Um, and it's also worth noting, I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from Ottawa today. Here in Canada, they just amended recently their, their medical aid and dying law. And now, now they allow you to effectively make some forms of advance requests for medical aid and dying. And, and so at the point in time that the clinician shows up to administer the injection, um, you may lack capacity at that time. That's sort of the whole point of this. But if you make any words, sounds, or gestures of refusal at the time, even though you don't really understand what your, um, those words, sounds, or gestures, um, that cancels all the authority for the clinician to proceed with the medical aid in dying. So she can't rely on the advanced directive. Um, she has to, you can inadvertently veto it. So to recap, um, the status of advanced directives for stopping eating and drinking in Arizona, not completely clear. Um, plus, of course, even if it were completely legally solid, you're going to have a fair number of clinicians exercise conscience-based objections, and, 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 and they can do that, right? You generally don't have to, as a, as a health, licensed healthcare professional, you generally don't have to provide healthcare that you have a moral objection to. Um, but it is worth planning ahead uh, because if you write an advanced directive for stopping eating and drinking today, right, given the course of dementia, it may, it wouldn't likely be triggered for five or more years until you get to that later stage of, of the disease. Um, and law, and this is happening, right? So there's a lot of activity now. So law and practice will evolve. So it's probably still worth drafting it today because by the time it's, it's it'll be relevant to enforce it, the situation may be clearer. So I just wanted to end with some, some practical tips uh, for an advanced director for stopping eating and drinking. This is sort of like a 12 step program. So one is you should definitely have a regular, you know, a regular advanced directive, um, you know, appointing an agent and an alternate agent and leaving instructions about your goals of care. But in addition for these, this type of directive for dementia directive, it would be a really good idea to also have a clinician confirm your capacity at the time that you're executing it, right? Because in the dementia context, there may be questions about whether or not you still had capacity at the time you signed it. So if you, you know, attached an affidavit or some letter from a clinician saying, yes, she had capacity at the time this was signed, that, that would help. It's very important to be clear on exactly what you want. Um, in some famous um, cases where patients tried to have VSED directives, 
uh, it didn't work out. So Margot Bentley up in British Columbia had worked in her earlier in her life as a dementia care nurse. So she knew exactly what it was that she wanted to avoid. So she wrote an advanced directive trying to achieve that. But the language she used was no nourishment or liquids. And the family though knew, knew what she wanted, even though it wasn't in the language of the directive, they you know, knew their mother. Um, and so asked the facility to stop spoon feeding her. The facility refused to honor that. The case goes to court, the family loses. Why? Because this, the court said, this is the language in the directive, no nourishment or liquids. She probably meant uh, artificial nutrition hydration because that's what patients almost always mean. In, when they write in advanced directive referring to, to nourishment. Uh, and then another case, uh, the Nora Harris case from Oregon, same thing. She had a basically a template uh, California directive, but uh, again, didn't have, you know, wasn't specific as to uh, stopping eating and drinking. So again, that family was unable to enforce her advanced directive or her, the wishes that, that they knew about her from outside the advanced directive. Um, so the, the takeaway lesson here is be specific, right? Use specific language like oral food and fluids, nutrition and hydration by mouth, hand feeding, spoon feeding, normal feeding. Um, and there is an alternative also, by the way, um, comfort feeding only, right? So the, I, and sometimes people would put that in their advanced directive as a backup to say, well, if you're not going to honor my request to stop eating and drinking, at least honor my request for comfort feeding only. So the idea here is, Stopping eating and drinking would mean no food or fluid, zero. Um, but comfort feeding only would be, it's, we're not going to give you all the food and fluid that you might need nutritionally. Um, we're only going to give you enough for comfort. So your, you, your death probably will be hastened. It just won't be hastened as quickly as with VSET. Okay, in addition to being clear on what you want, be clear on when you want it, right? So what are the triggering conditions when you don't recognize your family, for example? And then how do we measure that, right? How, you didn't, your family came to visit you five times in a row and you didn't recognize them any of the five times or does it have to be 10 times, right? So how do we measure the satisfaction of the triggering condition? Um, be clear on why you want this. Be clear on where you want, I mean, so, it is important to identify, some facilities are gonna be more receptive to this than others. So it would be helpful to identify your, your preferred uh, placement, memory facility. Um, show that you understand all of this, right? Say, hey, I, I read that book by Tim Quill and Thad Pope. I uh, watched that Arizona Bioethics Network webinar, right? Show, show the, the, the homework that you did so that these are informed preferences. Um, add a Ulysses clause. Talk about all of this with your agent and your alternate agent so they can be prepared to advocate for you, make sure they're on board with all this. Um, make copies of the directive. And I think I'm pretty sure Arizona has a registry, an electronic registry, add up to the registry to make sure this gets found. Um, and then finally, in addition to a document, it's the, the evidence shows that it's really, really helpful to make a video as well. So both your family as well as clinicians can see and hear you in your own voice explaining the, you know, that you want this and, and why. And it would make everybody feel more comfortable, um, oh, that this really was a genuine, authentic preference and more comfortable honoring it. So um, there is a growing demand for advanced directives for stopping eating and drinking, um, but they're still pretty new. Um, and we have very little guidance from courts or other regulators. Um, and we also have very few institutional policies and procedures. So do ho you know, hospice policies, long-term care facility policies, or, or training on this. Um, but the good news is there are a number of organizations that are pushing this. Um, and so it's gonna get, we're, we're gonna see more clarity uh, soon. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I've learned so much. Um, we actually have a couple of questions already. Um, one of them is that uh, Dr. Sklar says that thirst is a very serious barrier for stopping eating and drinking. Is there a way to overcome the desire for drinking? So it, 
it is, but the the clinicians that um, you know have done a, a fair number of VSED cases say the the sensation of thirst can be uh, completely not always right, but typically can be alleviated or eliminated um, without giving the patient liquid, you know, a volume of liquid that would undermine the VSED plan, right? So there are swabs, there's a thing like Evian has a spray. So these are ways just to moisturize the mouth, but you're not really getting hardly, you know, not even a full ounce of liquid. So the swabs and sprays, and I think you do need a qualified clinician. I think this emphasizes the fact that family lay members may not know how to do that competently. And I think, so that's, I think, emphasizes the role of, uh, of a good, of a good, of, of hospice involvement and maybe an experienced end of life doula. Um, but, but, that, but that mouth care can eliminate the sensation of thirst. So uh, someone asked also if there are any religious requests or beliefs that can override the state statutory laws. So could an agent with a religious belief override it, for example? Um, over, uh, override an advanced directive for uh, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. What if your agent betrays your wishes, as, I guess, because of a well, religious belief or or the so that's a good question. Um, this is actually one of my big pet issues, um, firing bad surrogates. But um, um, the answer is no, right? Uh, first of all, you should be really careful. This is why you should you should talk to the person and make sure um, you did. So uh, uh, only a small number of states require the agent to actually sign and agree to be your agent. In a fair number of states, you can complete an advanced directive, have it notarized, have it witnessed, and now that person is your agent. They don't even know you're your, they're your agent. You haven't even talked to them, but they are your agent. That, that's, and, the, and of course, you could run into the problem that you're describing, which is they're not on board with your preferences and values. Uh, so the, the best thing, of course, is to avoid that. But the And I haven't specifically researched Arizona, but almost always the law, uh, the agent's authority, the agent's job is to stand in your shoes and do what you would have wanted. So if there are specific instructions in the advanced directive, and that's generally thought to be a high level of evidence, clear and convincing evidence. If, if, if there's specific evidence of the patient's wishes in the advanced directive itself, the agent lacks the authority to contradict the advanced directive. So if the advanced directive says X, the agent can't say Y. Okay. She, this may happen, right? I mean, it, um, and, and, and on the sad truth is in the real world, um, clinicians hosp in hospital settings and other settings will follow the surrogate. They shouldn't, right? Because the surrogate really lacks the authority to do what they're doing legally. But in the real world, it's easier because the patient's incapacitated, right? So the patient isn't able to stand up for herself. The surrogate wants something. You know it's not what the patient would have wanted for herself. Clinicians, unfortunately, I think, cave in to bad surrogates and don't, and don't push back when they should. Okay, so there we've we're getting a lot of really good information uh, on the chat box. Um, there's a link to the state of Arizona Advanced Directives Clearinghouse, um, and also it's moving to the uh, different uh, location, and that link is up there. Um, so, uh, someone wants to know: Is there a caregiver burn down when it's time to stop feeding patients? Is there burnout um, from caregivers? Has there been a lot of pushback? for people who have watched their patients stop eating and drinking voluntarily. Yeah, the, we, the, here, I hear well, two things. One is, here's, here's a, I, I didn't mention this, but this is a, this is a sad reality. MAID is, is getting very well studied, right? We, because of all, all the states where it's available. So a lot of people are doing a lot of studies about MAID and, and, and both the patient experience as well as the caregiver experience as well as the clinician experience. VSED is not getting studied as well. We have, that's the reason why we wrote this book is to kind of help you know, prompt some more scholarly investigation. Um, 
but sure, right? Uh, and this is why, ideally, um, you're not going to have you're not going to have just hospice because hospice is what you know is only a handful of hours, and so primarily the burden is still going to be on the patient. So it would be if if you can, right? I know I appreciate not everybody can that on your own, in addition to the the uh, Medicare hospice benefit, you would get an end of life doula or even additional home nurses. Uh, to, so, so you can take a walk and, you know, so you can take care of yourself. So you're not completely focused on taking care of the patient. Um, and then uh, Althea Halchuk uh, sent the final exit uh, link. Um, and then uh, Dr. Robinson wants to know, can you specify that it's your agent who decides when you have reached the trigger or marker uh, to say it's time to stop eating and drinking rather than the measurements that you'd put in there? Yeah, I think th this, there's two issues with that. One is goes back to the question you just raised, which is about, well, it was more about burnout, but there's also a moral burden problem, right? Is right. if you completely say you figure it out, <laughs> I don't know that that's fair or kind to do to your agent um, to figure out when when is when is when. Um, so one, it's it, it's probably not even nice to do. Uh, it, so, and, but second, I think it, it this is a situation because this is a relatively new and as of right now unusual thing to do in an advanced directive. Right? People are fine turning off, you know. Uh, dialysis for somebody with end-stage renal disease but um this is this is this is new and i think you, you technically legally don't need to do that and you could completely defer to the agent um i think with with this it's better to really give as much guidance and, and it's not just guidance it's it's backup right it's it's almost saying i give you permission to do this um, and I think that, and that's there not just for the agent, so it takes some of the burden off of them, but it's also there because other people will be peeking in, perhaps the clinicians, but perhaps even adult protective services to say, hey, this looks like abuse, it looks like, or neglect. It looks like neglect of a vulnerable adult. Um, you say, no, no, it's not abuse of a vulnerable adult. She wanted this. And, and what are you going to show them, right? Um, if, if it's all completely a, a flat delegation to the agent, you have nothing to show them from first, you know, first person and authorization from the patient herself. Well, and I think uh, spelling it out like that uh, certifies your state of mind at the time you wrote it as well. If you can be that detailed, I think that's probably pretty good too. Um, so someone pointed out that even a wash rag just wet can provide some uh, comfort to someone who's thirsty. And then- um, but, but, but you gotta, again, you gotta be careful because if it's a if it's a soaked you know like if you soak it all right then then they're actually going to get a you know they could get get a fair amount of liquid um, by sucking out the right I mean this this is a problem which is that will on the one hand it will relieve the sense you know the thirst on the other hand even relatively small amounts of liquid could really prolong this so instead of being eight to fourteen days now it's going to be fourteen to thirty days right and that's not good so you got so you do have to be careful with that soak soaked rag. Okay, and in Arizona, the uh, health it's moved transitioning into Health Current uh, from the Secretary of State. So you would register it at Health Current. I think it's still under um, production yet. Um, there and there are. I mean, I yeah, I I, re I remember that it was being moved, but there are there are private registries as well, right? So you could go and there's a lot of them out there, but you and then you could just put the sticker on your driver's license. So everybody knows, well, it's here, right? It's at um, DocuBank or um, Living Well, Living Red, I forget the names of all of them. But there's, you know, there's a fair number of good ones. Okay. And then someone said they're under the impression that in Arizona, the agent or surrogate must follow the living will. Um, I think we touched I on said that. that. That's that's what I said before. You asked me if the if the agent with a religious objection could, right? Not, and I said no. So whoever that wrote that, I think thank God agrees. I with think you. we had already answered it. Yeah, um, and then um, Dr. Mayer says the patients who want this really need a support system, or they will be stymied by the system. They won't get what they want. They need to have an advocate, or it's likely to fail in AZ. Now she has quite a bit of experience in that regard, um, and. 
Dr. Ratto says, I always tell my clients to stay out of, of the institution because they can stay in their home. It's best because memory care in the institutions has state regulations that they have to feed and offer liquids. A death doula is a great thing. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of us out here. Yeah, uh, I should have said this. Um, let me just say two things about that last one. Is um, first, there there are no regs that require that, that the patient be fed if she doesn't want to be fed. I, I I think now that may be the perception of the of the facility administrator or the facility general counsel, but but it's it's definitely wrong, right? I mean those those regs are there for the patient's protection. If she doesn't want them, she can waive them, and that waiver needs to be respected. But, but that said, that is the world we live in, right? That long-term care memory, they're, they're gonna be freakishly, they're not gonna wanna do this. So one other path is, is a tweak on what you just said, which is not that you would keep them at home because that might be too much for the, for the family, but they can go to the memory care facility. But when they get to the point, you know, where they wanted the V said, then you take them out, right? And so there's a fair, there's a fair number of clinicians that say, yeah, that's what we've done. So they were at, the play, but then we, we rented, um, what are those things called? Airbnb or we, you know, we did a rental, right? So we found a two week rental um, and we moved them there. Now, again, of course, I realized there's an economic thing here. Not everybody, because then you need to go hire your own nurse and stuff, but uh, cause you've lost the, the ones at the facility, but for the people that have the money, you know, I don't, this may be 10, 20,000 or more, but, but um that that is the recommendation from the from the most experienced clinicians that I talk to, is to say check them out, um, and and do it somewhere off site. Uh, and Dr. Rat points out that uh, the facility will tell us all the time, or they will call Adult Protective Services, so to take them out, or they will call APA or Adult Protective Services. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it is, I mean, I get it. I'm not, I'm sympathetic to the, to the long, because they get fined a lot for not, for, you know, for malnutrition and, and dehydration and stuff. So it looks like exactly the thing that they're, con <laughs> they're, they're getting in trouble for a lot. So it, 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 it definitely, I get that it's raising a lot of red flags to have somebody not getting fed. And Robert Rivas is from Final Exit Network. And he says uh, they, phrased it so that the trigger for VSED is pretty clearly phrased, but the surrogate's interpretation is final and not subject to challenge. If the surrogate is well chosen, this will minimize the likelihood of a provider attempting to deny VSED by claiming not to know when the trigger takes place. And then Dr. Robinson points out, that if you take the patient out of SNF to do her SED, can the SNF call adult protective services uh, because you've removed them from the facility? Do you have to be secretive about why you're taking them out? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, uh, I guess in the ideal world, right, you would not, you would be less than fully transparent with, you know, we're taking them out so we could do this visa. <laughs> Um, in fact, so, so just a lesson, right, to learn from other patients' experiences. In the Margot Bentley case, that was going to be their plan. So Margot Bentley, the facility was not going to honor it, the, the directive. Or, um, and so the family's next move was to say, well, then we'll, we'll take her home. The facility said, no, you're not, right? So they did, they did get an order um, prohibiting the family from, from doing that. So... Um, and, and they and not doing it to be mean. I think they may feel that they have a duty to protect. Uh, you know, they have, they're mandatory reporters, and they may have that. They may actually have a duty to do that. So I think I do think that uh, I hate to say it because it sounds it sounds, but I, but I mean I don't know to, to be not fully transparent with the reason why you're taking them. Say we're we're gonna go visit somebody or some <laughs> grand grandchild's. A birthday party or something. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people are just commenting that APS is not very helpful um, to make sure you choose your surrogate, um, make sure your family knows well. Um, and uh, let's see, Margaret Bentley got everything she never wanted. And then uh, if a patient is on hospice, this would be a collaborative way to handle the discussion discrepancy for a sniff. Um, 
I guess I don't know what you mean, Patty, by uh, taking them out and saying we're, she's going to have hospice at home. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what she's saying. But um, say that taking them home for hospice. Yeah, there's there's a related, um, which I didn't get into, like there's a lot of tang uh So there's one other issue with hospice, which is, um, like I said, if you are, um, you know, somebody who's just in stage six Alzheimer's, they're not necessarily eligible for hospice. Um, they may not be terminally ill. Mm. And, and therefore the, v, the, the V said is the thing that's going to make them terminally ill. And so some hospices are actually okay with that. So I've talked to a fair number of medical directors who say, yeah, that's fine. Some would say, I mean, some would say it's fine. If you say you're gonna V said, that makes you terminally ill. Some would say, well, well, maybe on the fourth day, once you demonstrate your commitment to the VSA plan, then you're terminally ill, then you qualify for hospice. And some hospice, hospices will say, no, VSA is not a disease. Um, it, it, you can't qualify for hospice on the basis of, of, of VSA. So you, that's another thing you got to check out is what is, you know, when you pick a hospice. Hmm. So Dr. Mayer chimes in that you have to be a fast 7C to qualify for hospice. And Dr. Ratto says Medicare really regulates ALZ diagnosis. If you can't walk, can't talk, it's, it's tricky. So, okay, I, I don't see any other questions and I know it's late there for you already, uh, Professor Pope. This, this has been really um, enlightening and I really appreciate it. And I think everyone else does too. So. Uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you maybe at an ASBH again. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, and if, if feel free to email anybody if you have you know more more tips or comments or concerns. Okay. And sounds thanks for thanks for the good discussion. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And we'll be back next month with another webinar. Um, please check it out on our website. And this will be up on the recording will be up on uh, tomorrow, as well as these uh, great links in the chat. So thank you all very much, and have a great evening. <laughs>